La dinámica básicamente va a ser que el doctor Walker va a empezar, puede haber algunas preguntas, después empieza Cintia, preguntas, y después yo, preguntas, y básicamente son como una presentación como de 15 minutos, ¿no? 15 minutos. Presentation. Presentation. ¿Cómo? Ya. Yeah. Ok. ¿Sí? Más o menos. Bueno. Más o menos. Bueno, el doctor Walker empezó siendo un geógrafo humano con el doctorado en ciencia regional de la Universidad de Pensilvania, pero su carrera se fue perfilando hacia el lado cuantitativo de la geografía. Así que, gracias a que domina tanto la estadística como la economía, eh, es la geografía económica la disciplina en donde ha hecho más contribuciones. Su agenda de investigación ha estado centrada en los procesos de cambio de la cobertura, especialmente en las deforestaciones de los trópicos. El trabajo del Dr. Walker eh, lo ha sacado de los tópicos eh, convencionales de la geografía económica y en este momento podría decirse que es un científico de cambio de uso del suelo con un fuerte interés en la etnografía del campo. Cuando realiza los procesos que llevan a los cambios ambientales, el Dr. Walker siempre incluye aspectos que tienen que ver con la geografía humana y espacial. Aunque en sus inicios trabajó a nivel de hogar en los bosques tropicales de Brasil, hoy en día el Dr. Walker está alcanzando otras escalas de análisis incorporando la visión de la política ecológica en los procesos de cambios ambientales que suceden en la Amazonía y en otras regiones del mundo. Con fondos de NASA está modelando las, las interacciones tierra-clima a escala cuenca en el, en el Amazonas y con el apoyo de la National Science Foundation está también investigando la globalización de la economía ganadera en esa misma región y en México. Eh, presento también a Cintia para no interrumpir. Eh, Cintia eh, Simons, el lente de la doctora Simons utiliza, el, el lente, perdón, que la doctora Simons utiliza para su investigación se deriva principalmente de un enfoque de la economía política. Particularmente se concentra en el estudio de la manera en la que los procesos sociales interactúan a lo largo de las diferentes escalas que atraviesa a un municipio, por ejemplo, individual, local, regional, nacional y global. Y el impacto que dichas interacciones tienen en el ambiente y en las condiciones sociales a escala hogar. Su planteamiento teórico hace énfasis en lo local y en la importancia del sentido del lugar para entender los problemas sociales y ambientales. Para trabajar los problemas relacionados con la especificidad del lugar, la doctora Simons combina metodologías cualitativas y cuantitativas utilizando datos colectados a partir de trabajo de campo que involucra encuestas a nivel hogar y entrevistas a informantes clave. Bueno, bienvenidos. Gracias. Buenos días. Lo siento, pero voy a hablar en inglés. Uh, todavía estoy aprendiendo, intentando <laughs> hablar español, pero lo siento. First of all, I'd like to thank Martha for the invitation and for having organized this opportunity to talk with you all. And uh, in the spirit of the talk today, or the discussion today, I'm going to make comments on globalization, environment, and economy with a focus on <clears throat> the the beef industry here in, in Mexico. <clears throat> now what I'll say is based on work of a, a fair number of people. We have collabor collaborators in, in Mexico, of course, uh, and also in the US at the University of Florida and the University of Kansas. Now, one thing I want to say is my remarks will be presented in the context of, of free trade. Um, now, in North America, we tend to understand this as a set of agreements and understandings, uh, international understandings, beginning with the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs in the 1980s, or GATT, the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, and finally, uh, President Trump's uh, attempts to improve on NAFTA, the United States, Mexico, and Canada Agreement, or USMCA. Now, the, the focus of the talk today is going to be on uh, the, the impacts of free trade on the beef supply chain here in, in Mexico, and also on how changes in the beef supply trade uh, chain affect the forest biomes. Now, of course, uh, beef is produced from cattle, which are very uh, demanding of land. Pasture covers a vast amount of the Mexican national territory. 
If you look at deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon, 80 to 90 percent of all deforested areas are under pasture now. So it's it's very important um, the, the relationship between pasture and pasture expansion and forest biomes is is a key environmental issue. So the, the conceptual basis for our work, a uh, couple models here. I don't want to spend too much time on them since I've got, I guess I have 15 minutes, but <laughs> am I speaking too fast? I can't spend, you know. <laughs> on the left, we have a conceptual framework which links what we're calling distal forces to proximate causation in land change. Proxima, proximate causation being the a actions actually taken by producers on the ground. And then linkages here are twofold. Uh, the linkages are via the market and supply and demand dynamics, and also via what we're calling here, well, it's listed, uh, it's represented here as teleconnections, but I'll be using the word <laughs> telecoupling um, later in the presentation. Now, the real model uh, that I'd like you to, to think about, don't pay attention to all the you know, the, the busy text on the left, but the real model of interest is the one on the right, where, and this is the heart of the research we're doing, and it's the idea that changes in the geography of agriculture, including Ganadaria, is going to be fundamental in understanding the changes in the distribution of forest biomes. Here, well, here in Mexico, but also more generally wherever uh, you might be. So it's, it's very interesting if you look at the land change that's occurred in Mexico over the past several decades. I hope you can, you can kind of see this, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you what the real story is here. These are data from uh, Inehi, and what they show are periods of land, land cover change with focus on the forest biomes, and the data are presented in the aggregate uh, for, the, for forest cover or whatever it might be and also disaggregated into biomes. So we have TF for temperate forest, THF for tropical humid forest, and TDF, I think it is, yeah, okay, for tropical dry forest. And there are two things I'd like to point out here. One is that if you look at the rates of deforestation, the change in the rates moving from left to right in the diagram, we see that they tend to be coming down over time, okay? And that a real important marker of this downturn in the rate of uh, in the rate of tropical uh, deforestation is the onset of, of NAFTA. Okay? Now the other point that I'd like to call your attention to, if we look at the disaggregated numbers, is quite interesting. Uh, when we when we look at the tropical, or excuse me, the temperate forest in particular, we see that the negative numbers shift to a positive number. And what that means is that well, the phase of forest loss in the temperate areas is over, and that the temperate forest is beginning to recover lost ground in a process that many people refer to as forest transition. The others are all negative, although, they're, as I say, the rates are, have been reduced over time. Now here's the question. Is free trade responsible for what we're seeing, both at the aggregate level of Mexican forest cover and also within the individual forest biomes, okay? Now if so, we have what people might refer to as a neoliberal win-win, okay? In, in this case, there's no trade-off between environment and economy. We have market expansion, okay, with hopefully a trickle-down effect and rising average incomes per capita incomes, which we, we have observed in Mexico over the past several decades, although, uh, that's completely uh, transparent to problems with poverty and income distribution, but I'll push that aside for the moment. And at the, at the same time, we have the mitigation of environmental harm. In this case, the, the slowing of deforestation, particularly in tropical human, tropical human forests. So, once again, you know, here's a model, uh, a very confusing one that does not reproduce, and you don't really need to know what's going on here. Let me just tell you what it, what it says or what the, the meaning of the model is. This particular model shows how free trade, the NAFTA agreement, has enabled the intensification of production here, particularly of beef, okay? And essentially what happened was the, 
prior to NAFTA, beef production was expensive, uh, corn prices were high, and uh, the Mexican producers had to rely on traditional grass-fed systems. With NAFTA, the bottom fell out of corn prices. Uh, beef producers could move to a feedlot system based on animal feeds, uh, primarily corn or maize. So, what I want to say here before I leave the slide is that, um, in our thinking is this, that it was the, it was the change in the, 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 the possibilities of trade which allowed for the intensification of beef production, which is based on, and this will become important what I say, based on this, a feedlot system of production. So, what are the economic consequences? I'm, I'm not going to talk about all of them. I mean, there are a lot of economic consequences, but this is, is a pretty telling one. This is data from, uh, I believe, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. See, so the graphs are from the perspective of the U.S., the way you should interpret them. So, the, what are shown here as imports, the blue line going up, okay, those are imports to the U.S., and therefore exports from, from Mexico. Okay, whereas uh, the orange uh, dash line that is, is, is pretty bumpy shows as exports, okay, those are actually imports coming to Mexico. And what you see is right after the, the, the onset of NAFTA, there's, a, there's an explosion in imports of beef to, to Mexico. And beef, uh, Mexico is, a, is, a, is a significant importer, it's a very important market for U.S. produced beef, but what happens is o over time, and it's, it's very dramatic, starting around 2007, as the feedlot system really begins to come online, we get a tremendous surge in export of beef from uh, Mexico to the U.S. In fact, at the present time, uh, Mexico is a net, ex a net exporter of beef, and not only to the U.S., but to 17 countries internationally, which is a complete change in the whole picture of, of uh, cattle, the cattle economy of, of Mexico. So that's one of the economic consequences, and once again, to emphasize this, this has been largely enabled by uh, the feedlot system of production. If we trace that back, well, the feedlot system of production is there because of free trade, and then if we go forward, we say that free trade, it has enabled this, this sort of growth. Or the, I, I could say, the, uh, the increased production of this particular sector. So, what about the environmental implications of all of this? Now, I pointed out that there's a slowing rate of deforestation, and let me, let me say right up front, and there are a lot of environmental consequences of uh, the beef supply chain, okay? And I'm not talking to here about greenhouse gas emissions, for example, which is very important and we're working on on that, we're looking strictly at land and strictly at the impact on, on forest biomes. And so there's a slowing rate of deforestation. So one question, which, which would see, seem obvious, is that, uh, well, is NAFTA behind this? Is free trade behind this? Okay, and this is what, uh, this is pretty much the neoliberal narrative that free trade solves all problems, if you will. You know, it, it solves economic problems and it does so in a, in a very uh, salubrious way. You know, it doesn't, it mitigates environmental harms, it doesn't create them. So, you know, one of the, one of the um, concepts, or I should say, one of the foundations of this explanation is the notion of technological improvement. Much of that you know, neoliberal story is based on this. And so, well, the technological improvement is supposed to lead to agricultural intensification. And what we mean by that is that uh, systems of production are, are so productive that they need less land to produce the same amount of whatever it is, maize, cattle, beef, and the like. Now, this explanation has been behind, uh, many scholars have pointed to this as being foundational to forced transition. And more recently, the concept of land sparing has arisen uh, to explain what the possibilities are of agricultural intensification. And much of this gets, gets uh, uh, discussed in, in light of what's called the Borlaug hypothesis. And Borlaug is, is an interesting uh, person. He spent a, a lot of time in Mexico. 
He's considered one of the founders of the Green Revolution. And what the Borlaug hypothesis says is that, well, technological change holds the key to saving the tropical forest. This is what he wrote in a, in a science article, a fairly recent one that was really published quite late in his career. So that is the, the, the concept of the Borlaug hypothesis. Now, it turns out that there's, there's, there's not empirical support for it yet. There's been quite a bit of research that looks, looks at it. Not, you know, and, and, and you know, the jury's still out. And uh, so we don't know. My question here, and the question, one of the questions, well, I raise this in somewhat of a provocative way, uh, but actually our research goes to this. And one question would be, well, given what I've told you, uh, and I have to show the intensification part that, that's coming. Will Mexico approve Borlaug right? Okay. And here's the provocative question. Has NAFTA saved Mexico's economy in, in force? Now that's a facetious question. But, okay, we move on. I told you I would fill in the, the productivity side of the discussion, or of the, you know, the changes, the environmental, or the, the, yeah, the environmental implications of of free trade, and if we look at Mays, well, between 1990 and uh, 2016, there's been a, a big increase in Mays productivity. Well, these are national numbers. Uh, productivity numbers uh, are high in other, other places, so this is nationally aggregated data. But even so, there's, there's quite an increment in productivity. Now, for beef, it, it's a little bit trickier to get numbers here, and the numbers I'm putting up are numbers that we've derived on our project with our collaborators in, at the Autonomous University of Chicago. And what we see is that the actual, well, the productivity in terms of space, if you will, the number of animals produced per, or processed per hectare per year, well, under a traditional system, it, it's about 0 0.06, but it, it more than doubles under a feedlot system, today's uh, majority system, to 0.14 animals, okay? But not only that, the productivity of time has, has also increased significantly. And we dropped from over a thousand days to reach the point of, of sacrifice or, or slaughter to 570 days uh, under the current system. So there's been a significant change in productivity both in terms of the land demand and the time taken to produce, you know, I hate to use the word, but the animal or, or the beef. So it, it, there, there's no way to deny it. There's been an increased productivity. Now, I want to pause for a moment <clears throat> and develop some context here because in the end we'll, we'll um, come back to this. The context being the, the Paris Climate Treaty. And once again, thinking about the environmental implications of NAFTA uh, with respect only to, to forest biomes. Now, the, the way the Paris Climate Treaty works is that um, the, uh, the parties to the treaty have all uh, developed what are called <clears throat> intended nationally determined contributions to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> In mo you know, <clears throat> if you read through these, I, I don't recommend you do do it unless you you, know, you want to go to sleep within 30 <laughs> seconds or so. But the uh, you know the, the, much of the, the much of the commitment to the reductions have, if you look at the individual countries, there'll be programs about uh, reducing fossil fuel uh, combustion primarily. But for for countries with nations with a lot of forests. There's oftentimes introduced a UN red component to the, uh, the contribution. In other words, greenhouse gas emissions will be reduced by reducing deforestation and forest degradation. <clears throat> now, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. I don't, you, may not, you may not know this, but uh, your, your country has committed to reaching 0% deforestation in about 10 years. And, uh, you know, that, that's great. I think that's a wonderful target. Uh, now, if it does, you know, will it be a case that Mexico uh, is in a win-win uh, win situation? And more provocatively, provocatively, could we conclude that this modernization um, has 
both been instrumental in, in raising incomes um, and also in some form of environmental mitigation, in this case, loss of tropical forest. Okay, so that's some context that I wish to come back to. And, you know, going forward from this point, I want to I want to consider the following. The, the notion of the actual productivity measures of, of uh, beef production in particular. And if you look at the traditional grass-fed system and look at the tiny box feedlot, well, this is, this is figurative, you know, relative size. Well, if you have thousands of animals on 100 hectares, I mean, the stocking density is order of magnitude is more than having, say, 0.5 animals uh, per hectare. Okay, so, you know, looking at it naively like that, it's, it's obvious that the feedlot system is, is much more productive. If you add maize into the equation, well, it doesn't take that much land to produce the maize that's needed. So, overall, it's, it's really not, there's not, not that much land involved. Now, the problem is that um, many times when we do the, these sorts of calculations, we overlook the supply chain aspect and the fact that there are multiple inputs to the feedlot. And one of the critical inputs, of course, is the feeder cattle. Well, these are produced not on feedlots, but on cow-calf operations, which are essentially as land demanding as the old traditional grass-fed system. Now, where it gets tricky in terms <coughs> of the calculations is that, that the, if the feeders are provided by some other nation, okay, we would call this a telecoupling. And if so, the calculations might be totally transparent to this phenomenon, you might conclude erroneously that, you know, it's just the land and the feedlots and the maize that is providing for the, uh, uh, the, the production of beef. But there's likely to be a lot more coming from somewhere else. Now that's true. So, and some of the work we've done, once again, with our, our colleagues in Chapingo, and this is also a terrible, doesn't come through very well. These are uh, figures I took out of a manuscript that's under revision. But what, what I want to call, call, two things to call your attention to, uh, we've been able to determine what, the nations that, to which Mexico exports beef, okay? And we've also been able to determine a great deal about this, the input of supplies to the beef production system. And it's the bottom panel that I, I, I'd like to call your attention to, and in particular to the dark arrows that are snaking around from south up into Yucatan and then into Mexico. And what they show, that they, they're coming from the south and across the Guatemala, you'll see a little band of, of red and pinkish blotches. Those are municipios, okay? And the, the color, the intensity of the color is proportionate to the, the amount of, of feeders or number of calves that are being documented at uh, federal sanitary inspection points along, well, in this case, the uh, Caratera Fronteras. Okay, now, if you look to the right, in particular to the, to the upper panel, these are the primary origins, and this was just, I don't know, 2018, I believe, Benemérito de los Américas, which is really, I mean, who's ever been there? I, I, I've been there, actually, and, uh, <laughs> for, for this reason, but there are a lot of cattle being registered, a lot of feeders being registered there. And well, if you drive around, you don't see any much evidence of a lot of cow-calf operations. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that it's contraband. It's coming across the border from Guatemala. And in fact, that's one of the reasons we went to observe this. And uh, we, we stayed out there for a while and counted the number of howlers riding down Caratera uh, Fronteriza and just did some back of the uh, table napkin calculations uh, based on the frequency of, of the passage of the howlers and the number of feeders or calves you'd see in them. And you, you come to an astonishing number, which is between one and two million a year. Okay, well, it seems like a lot, you know? And so they're coming in other places. They come in the, through that band. And in fact, you know, we surmise that this is where many of the feeders are coming from. So, well, as it turns out, I'm going to put some of this all together into context of the, the industry and the cattle herd here, which we have on the left, the, the Mexican herd. 
And it, once again, it doesn't show very well, but it's broken down. The, the Mexican herd uh, in total comprised of dairy cattle and uh, beef cattle ranging on, on pastures. Uh, and as we move to the right in the blue bands, we start getting the, the number of cattle that are, that are confined in, in feedlots. And at the very top of the far right uh, bar, we see a flesh-colored uh, rectangle, which is our estimation of the, the number of, of cattle that are in Central America that are sourcing, if you will, the, the feeders to the Mexican supply chain. And so on the, on the right side of the panel, and I'm getting really close to the conclusions, and I don't think I've even gone ahead now. So the yearly demand for, for feeders. Now, if you look at the feedlots, and there are a lot of numbers that go into this calculation, but they need about 4 million feeders per year coming into production. Now, the, the cow-calf operations that are domestic provide 2.6 million, which leaves a deficit of 1.4 million. Where, where do they come from? Well, it's pretty amazing because that number is kind of pretty close to the to the back of the pants calculation that we made in on the Carretera from Teresa. They, they're coming from Central America. So what is the implication here? Well, there are a couple. If you look at this number and you make some assumptions, for example, that there wasn't much of this happening, say, in 1990, then we might say this represents a, you know, an increment in the, in the number of feeders coming across the border. And then over time, that has built to a demand for land of 102,000 square kilometers. Okay. Now that's, once again, that's a number that comes from our calculations from data uh, with our, uh, that we collected with our Chipingo colleagues. Now if you take that number and divide by the period, you get something like 4,000 square kilometers per year. Okay. Now what does that number mean? Well, we, we don't know whether, how much of this is deforestation because there are old pastures that can be occupied in Central America. But we're pretty sure that it accounts for a large fraction of deforestation in Central America. During this period, deforestation in Central America averaged about 4,000 square kilometers per year. So the numbers are, are somewhat close. And the other thing is that if you look at this number and compare it to the number of, uh, that we had previously of the rate of deforestation in the tropical humid forest of Mexico, it's a lot, lot bigger. Okay, so what does it mean? Oh, well, a couple. Oh, let me before I really do the conclusions. What it means is that it's, there's what IPCC calls a leakage effect. So the the economic dynamics of the Mexican supply chain is leaking some of its environmental impacts, if you will, across the border where they aren't seen necessarily by those who collect statistics. Uh, in Mexico, or researchers such as myself, okay? And so here are the, here are the conclusions that we draw based on that observation. It does, this doesn't appear to be a win-win, actually, because if you add that, uh, well, we don't know exactly how much it is, but whatever it is, if you add it back to the deforestation that we're observing in the tropical humid forests of Mexico, it's not gonna show a declining rate, okay? So that's one conclusion. The second conclusion that there's there's no land sparing going on, really, and well, the Borlaug hypothesis, you know, see you later. I don't. We haven't done much for it, and we haven't done much for you know the neoliberal hopes here. And finally, and this the third conclusion is really more a question: What are the implications for the Paris Climate Treaty? And I'm sure this is not a unique situation. And the problem is that the Paris Climate Treaty is based on nationally determined contributions, and yet economies are so complex, as we've seen here, I mean, should you count the deforestation in Central America attributable to the, the Mexican supply chain to Central America or to Mexico? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know, this would be on my paper to answer. But what I would say is that at the very least, the Paris Climate Treaty signatories should perhaps consider a more regional approach in which all the trade relations of relevance to this sort of phenomena are taken into account. And that is the presentation.
I was wondering how did NAFTA affect this, affect the farm trade? Because because uh, I think we cannot analyze beef uh -huh. without corn, right? You could, and actually we analyzed, we calculated the, the amount of land required for all inputs to the Mexican feedlots. And so what NAFTA did was, well, uh, prior to NAFTA there were, there were some structural readjustments within Mexico. There was the dismantling of fair stables and price supports. There was a huge price shock. And so what NAFTA did uh, in combination with, the, with this was to allow a very cheap corn flood into the country, okay, which was devastating to most of the rural sector. Okay, but looking at the cattle economy itself, well, you know, over time, uh, well, much of it, uh, how much is it? Two thirds. Well, first of all, let me say that NAFTA tripled the amount of corn that is consumed internally, whether by humans or animals. Okay, so now I believe it's uh, the, the amount of, amount of uh, corn that's consumed internally is 38 million metric tons. Okay, now of that, two thirds goes to feedlots. Okay, so what can you say? Well, a lot of it is uh, is imported. Oh, is it two thirds? It, I believe it's two thirds. Or it's, no, it's two thirds that's imported. Okay, so much of it is imported, which means once again there's this leakage effect that uh, the corn demanded for the Mexican supply chain, much of it's sourced from the U.S. Now, it, in the, it, ultimately, it doesn't matter much because the amount of land is relatively small. You can produce a huge amount of corn on relatively small amounts of land. So if you compare the amount of land needed in the U.S. for the corn to the amount of land needed in Central America for the beef, there's really no comparison to the effects on it in Central America. And so we would say that, well, NAFTA is what is, in essence, I don't want to say enabled, but sparked the the leakage to sourcing from outside national boundaries. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yes, I'm just I'm thinking about other implications of that. Not, not only uh, forest or the land use, right? Oh, there are there, so many other implications because... Yes, yes. For example, enteric fermentation from you know, ruminant livestock. Okay, methane releases. Now, I frame this entirely within a deforestation story, right? Just to make life easy, and plus, Mark only gave me 15 minutes. So, <laughs> so, but in fact, if you look at the greenhouse, this is where the story gets really more difficult, but perhaps more interesting. The impacts, the greenhouse gas emission impacts from the, the cattle that are now in the Mexican herd are much greater than the greenhouse gas emission impacts of the deforestation that must have resulted, that had to have resulted from the increment of herd. So they, in essence, swamp the, uh, you know, swamp the land change deforestation effect. But I, I focused on the deforestation effect because of the nationally determined contributions, which are there. You can read them. Zero percent deforestation. You can draw your own conclusions as to whether or not you'll reach it. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, and well, my question is about the forest transition uh -huh. hypothesis. So in theory, uh, forest transition implies uh, local development, urbanization, and other mm -hmm. uh, apparently positive uh, changes. Mm -hmm. So have you seen some evidence of this happening really in, in, fact, in, in, the, in the Chiapas region? Or I was wondering if those positive changes could happen not locally, nor not where the, uh, the intensification of, of, of the big pollution is happening. Yeah, well, the first question, Chiapas, okay, it's mostly tropical humid forest. So, but I, I could answer the question with respect to the temperate forest. Actually, Marta is, is, is an expert on this, but I'll, I want to <laughs> push it off. On her. In fact, part of our study is addressing forest transition in, in the Pascuaro uh, water basin. And so, 
<clears throat> you do observe forced transition in places. Okay, but there are a lot of unanswered questions, such as, should you consider an avocado plantation with a closed canopy part of the forest transition? So, you know, we're, we're sorting out a lot of those conceptual difficulties. Now, the second part was about observing, I think, a, a distant form it, transition it, it, from... It, 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 not only the, the forest recovery process, uh -huh. but the other benefits of the forest transition. So uh, oh, okay. more uh, technological development, or like a... Sure, well first of all, yeah. Like, excuse me, sorry. Yeah, no, no. Okay, so like, the first part, I think, agricultural intensification, well, that's not really the only <clears throat> hypothesized factor in forest transition. I mean, there are a number of others. Uh, the emergence of public policy, relative to <coughs> conservation of natural lands would be one. Institutional factors, uh, say indigenous communities, for example, might have an easier time of conserving their forest or more incentives than, say, I don't want to say Anahita, but certainly, say, private landholders. So there, there's that, in, there are that institutional aspects of it. Now, as far as forest transition, it's, it's contribution to ecological services. I think that's the second part of the question. Well, when, 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 when people first started <clears throat> thinking about forest transition, it was, com it, was, it was in the context of, oh, the restoration of the forest that was there before. <coughs> and, well, the idea then is that, well, if you get the original forest, then you restore the original ecosystem services. Okay. So then people started noticing that, well, you know, the forest, when it comes back, well, it may not be the same forest. So, you know, what if the species are different? Well, that may not make a difference if they're, like, and I'm thinking of the Amazon, for example, if they're, the species come back, but they're still all, you know, tropical broadleaf species, and you're simply changing the relative distribution of the species. You still get the same ecosystem services. But what if you count, say, a eucalyptus plantation? as part of a forest transition. And so in Brazil, the entire state of Sao Paulo, and if you go down to Santa Catarina and the states farther south, where much of the Atlantic rainforest has been destroyed, over 90%. Well, what are they doing? Uh, they're planting eucalyptus on the hillsides. I think they do it here as well. And the people who have looked at forest transition have put this out as a type of forest transition. Well. I think we know that the ecosystem services are going to, you know, the contributions are going to be completely different and back in the way. And avocado presents a whole new complex of problems. Just a comment on the extra, extraterritorial emissions, which you were really talking about in terms of the cattle, something that Greta Thunberg says we should be thinking about more, and other people. I mean, the parallel is in, in Mexico is in timber. In timber uh, timber for construction, for furniture, for, for packaging, and so on. Most of the timber is not is coming from Chile and coming from Brazil, um, and it's increasing. So it's a similar, it's a parallel story of you could say exporting deforestation. I mean, possibly Chile and Brazil are producing the timber in a in a very sustainable way, possibly, right, yeah. um, and more than may, may call would. But it's it's a parallel to what you're uh, exactly, about. yeah. yeah. You're asking what I think about that? <laughs> well, it's a comment. It's a comment, right? It's, it's, a, comment. it's, a, comment. it's a comment on yeah. we should think wider than the, the boundaries of one nation. I mean, how can you, you know, solve all the problems within one nation when there are yeah. these trade relations, the trade relations that, you know, the neoliberal dictum created? I mean, I just don't understand it. Thank you. It's similar with dairy industry in Mexico, no? about uh, the economic dynamics, exports and imports. It, it's similar? With other parts of the With, with milk, particularly with milk industry. Dairy, dairy. You know, um, I'm going to have to say I don't know, because so far I've only focused on this. And my excuse is that <clears throat> up until two years ago, I spent all my time in Brazil. So somewhat okay. of a newcomer. I can answer questions about this. but. I don't think I can on that. If anybody else would like to care to help me out, please do. <laughs> they look like beetles, no? Yeah. They're yeah. in the Lala company. Sure. Uh, 
Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I'm it's agree. more intensive and reduces the land use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it ties directly to pasturage because uh, you produce the dairy cattle from So, you know, there's all, there is a tie in here. And the USMCA is dealing with precisely some of these issues, particularly with Canada, between the US and Canada. So the, these issues are in evidence for sure for a wide variety of commodities. I still think the Paris climate tree is a good thing though. Thanks. Última pregunta, perdón, comentarios. Bueno, muchas gracias. Otra vez. Sí. It's really great to be here. I am going to speak as well in um, Spanish, but if you have any questions, if I mean in English. <laughs> See, I'm already I'm speaking Portuguese in English, I kind of throw it all. I speak Portuguese, and now I'm, you know, I'm not, I think my Portuguese is bad and my Spanish is bad, and I can't even speak English, so. But I'm going to try to speak very slowly. If you don't understand something I say, just raise your hand. Uh, let me know, interrupt, I don't mind. Um, I've, ever since I was a child, I swear, I speak really quickly because I was the youngest and no one listened to me. So I'd speak really quickly, so they'd say, what? And then let me repeat myself. Um, so I'm glad of my presentation is following from Bob's because he discussed much about those linkages between you know, what's happening at the global level and their implications for what's actually happening at the local level. And so I'm going to try to tie that together with my talk today. Um, specifically looking at the work I've been doing with colleagues in the Brazilian Amazon. Um, again, I thought I had a half hour, so I'm going to go quicker and kind of skip through things. Um, so let me start then, so there's not a lot of time. So I'm talking about smallholders, agrarian reform, and globalization, and the implications both for the environment and for the people. This is from a paper I did with a colleague of mine, um, Heath Maria Pereira and, and, and Bob Walker. Um, and if you want more information on it, it's available uh, on open source. Um, and if you have any questions, just let me know. But I thought it was a good example because I think some of the questions we're having about you know, the role that NAFTA has had on the, the global cattle economy, the Mexican cattle economy, how does that implicate the smallholders on, on, in the, at the local level who are producing corn? Is that impacting their economic activities? Um, are they faring well or, or, or poorly? And so that's the other aspect of uh, the Mexico project, and I think that's what um, you know, Martha's going to be discussing today and some things we're trying to understand. But the work we did here on, uh, in this region in Brazil, I think, raises some of those questions, and um, I think it's a good example to bring. Actually, I had three case studies I was going to give, but I decided to just focus on one for the half-hour time limit. So the research motivation, of course, is deforestation. Tropical deforestation in Brazil, about 80 to 90 percent, goes to pasture, as uh, you know, Bob mentioned. Um, it's really problematic still, despite declines in the turn of the millennium. We're seeing rates of deforestation increase again. There's a great deal of policies to uh, curb deforestation and to uh, basically improve degraded lands, uh, 
from international policies and programs such as RED to national policies, the forestry code. Ranchers, um, you large ganaderias, they have you know, the zero deforestation agreements they've made that they're not going to deforest to produce green beef. Forestry code has required that in this region, 50% of their land is in past, as in forest. Of course, in the region where I'm studying, they cleared everything, so now they have to reforest. Um, so these are issues, uh, policy considerations. And smallholder farmers, um, they're supposed to, when they are part of a settlement, they're supposed to be doing small family agriculture, diversified agroecology. And it's in the, in the policies of uh, Brazil's uh, Institution for Colonization and Agrarian Reform. So these are all great for curbing deforestation um, in the tropical regions. However, the reality is that cattle is important across the re region for small farmers, small holders to very large holders, from you know, traditional extractive rubber tappers who are now doing cattle to even indigenous uh, regions and territories where they also um, incorporated cattle. And the question is, why? Um, is this happening, and what are the implications? And we argue in this paper and demonstrate, I hope I can demonstrate today, that the global cattle production chain now is linking the large ranchers with the smallholders. Is that good for the smallholders? Is it good for the large ranchers? Um, what about the environment? What are the environmental implications? Let me give you a little bit of background since um, I'm here in Mexico talking about Brazil. Many of you have, I know, I'm sure, of all the great development advances in the 1960s in Brazil and, and around uh, many countries. Brazil's uh, military government invested in infrastructure, road building. They invested in agro industry in particular, trying to increase overall economic growth. They also, uh, instead of doing agrarian reform, of course, agrarian issues, inequality in land, latifundia was one of the main impetuses for the uh, military takeover, military coup in 1964. But they didn't do grand reform, instead they did colonization. They had all this land in the north, in the Amazon, and so their idea was to bring men without land to land without men. And so instead of dealing with land inequality elsewhere, which was politically problematic, um, they just brought them all to the Amazon. And so it's different than here, um, where you had the grand reform. And I was thinking of you know, the settlements where people live today, uh, the Hidos, they've lived there all their life. In the settlements in the Amazon, they're new to the region. And much of the land is forested, much of it's been cleared for pastures. There's, there's some differences I'm gonna try to, to point out. So what were the, cattle out, the outcomes? While the cattle economy is strong, Brazil's one of the leading exporters of, of beef. Um, the population in the Amazon grew tremendously from 4 million to uh, upward of, of 25 million. However, there's still rural poverty, there's still landlessness, and land conflict uh, violence is very problematic. Much of my research actually focuses on land conflict violence, and so I have other papers in this regard. Um, but I've always, and my big concern has always been um, people and the impact on people and their livelihoods. So I'm not an environmentalist, I just happen to work in a region that has you know, an environment that people are concerned about. Um, so, as I said, there's agrarian reform laws in Brazil, some land statutes going back to 1850. Land's supposed to meet a social function. If you, if it doesn't, it can be expropriated. Uh, land, if you occupy it for a, and it's public land, and there is a lot of public land in Brazil. Um, public land, you occupy it for a year and a day, you can, ask the government for title to that land. If you occupy private land for five years in a day, then you can basically request title to that land as well. And like I said, Brazil didn't have an agrarian reform. Instead, they did colonization um, from 1964 to 1988. Some of it is considered not successful because there's all these benefits that was supposed to come with the colonization. But it was, it was successful in bringing people to the Amazon because people came, even if their actual uh, benefits never uh, materialized. And in 1988, with the uh, re return of democracy, there also was this you know, pledge to do a grand reform, um, but there also was an economic crisis, and there was a growing concern about deforestation, and so all of the colonization programs were stopped. So the government wasn't doing 
even if they weren't successful, they weren't doing colonization. So what my colleagues and I have argued in other papers as well is that the people decided to take it into their own hands, doing direct action land reform, much of it uh, at the leadership of social movements. And so we call this dollar, direct action land reform. If the government's not going to do it, the people are going to do it. And so this is how we describe direct action land reform. As I said, it's you know, initiated by social movements, the most famous of which is uh, the Rural Landless Workers Movement of the Rural Landless Workers. Um, their central strategy, which is actually, there actually are many uh, landless movements, um, not just the MST, especially in the Amazon. Some are actually more important than the MST, but they all have the same strategies. Uh, and one of the primary uh, strategies of these uh, movements is to occupy latifundia. They don't go to uh, Te de Luc, the government land that's not occupied. They look for large land holdings that are not meeting their social function. They're either violating an environmental law, environment, uh, violating labor laws, uh, or their land is not productive. Because according to the Constitution, they then can petition the government to expropriate it and give it to them. Of course, this becomes really problematic, and this is here is where the violence comes in. Because many large landowners, these large ranchers, they don't want to give up their land. And they have their own private militia to deal with the occupation. So the landless movement say it's an occupation, whereas the large ranchers call it an invasion. And so this is the, the context within which this study is, is happening in this region. Um, they come overnight sometimes, maybe mobilized from local urban areas where uh, they moved to because they didn't have land or they didn't have jobs. They get mobilized to occupy a piece of property, the property they may have you know, been looking at these properties for a long time, trying to decide which one they're going to occupy. And so um, overnight, they'll meet, and there'll be hundreds of them that will go and occupy the land. It's very uh, coordinated. They can now, today, contact the media. They want the media there, because in 1996, the El Dorado dos Capuchas massacre happened, even though they had shot, you know, pictures of it as well. It avoids, you know, things happening as they did in the past. They may get kicked off the land, they may reoccupy the land, they, be, they could be living in an encampment, an encampamento for up to 10 years before the government may come in then to decide, okay, this land, do a vistoria, do an analysis to decide is it, you know, is it really not productive and determine whether the land should be expropriated. If they're lucky in 10 years, they live in a settlement, a formal settlement. So it's a long, lengthy process and there's much change that occurs on these, these properties. There's uh, upward of 161,000 families uh, that are in these types of settlements, and uh, close to, you know, probably at this point, it's more than 70 million hectares of, of land that they've occupied. And of course, land conflict is really, like I said, problematic. Um, it kind of is interesting, because maybe it's not as dramatic as, you know, sometimes what may be happening in Mexico, what could be happening in Syria, but you have 1,500 uh, people dying, it murdered because of land conflict in, the, in this region. Um, it is quite a few, almost 50% of all the land conflict related deaths that happen are happening in the Amazon, and most of it is happening in this study region. And so I have other papers that talk more about that. So to deal with this, uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso came up with the New World World. He was there was a lot of pressure given the, the massacre of El Dorado in 91. And the whole idea, this is a neoliberal idea that we're going to create small family farmers, provide them with the resources they need to be successful. So there's certain policies that INCRA, which is the National Colonization and Agrarian Reform Institute, requires that the first step is that the people who want the settlement have to create an association. So they have to organize themselves. Um, after they need to, after they're organized, they need to come up with a development plan. And so they have consultants that come and help them do a development plan, but they lay out exactly what their economic activities will be. Um, and according to the INCRA policy and the laws, it has to be diversified, small family agriculture, uh, agroecology, um, and there has to be, especially when it's a movement led, so let's say that the MST, their main mission and their main concern is that it be um, food security and uh, the environment has become very important. And if they have this plan, once it's in place, they get a suite of credit with which to 
put their plan into practice. Here's a list of all the different types of uh, credit. I won't go through great detail. The key thing to keep in mind is that's not a gift, it's credit. It means it has to be paid back, but there's a whole suite of credit that's supposed to really help make it possible for them to become uh, successful small family farmers. Uh, they have a, a variety of agricultural credits, starting with uh, the very first agricultural activity, and then they can get some follow-up if they do successful and they pay back their loans. So there's a suite of credit they can receive. Yep. So the interesting thing, though, is you know, with this expectation, if you look at the policy and you look at the movements who are leading these uh, occupations, you would expect to see in these settlements uh, small family farmer, uh, farmers involved in agriculture, agroforestry, and diversified production. And I've read all the development plans. Most of them are actually the same because it's the same consultant. They just kind of changed the history. And, um, but you would expect, based on the plans and the policies, based on the laws, that that's what they would be doing. Well, and, and like I said, the philosophy of MST and others, food sovereignty and agroecology. But however, the reality is incredibly different. There's uh, work that's been shown uh, across the Amazon. Uh, cattle is becoming the most important activity. In fact, in 2006, uh, myself and colleagues did a, an expansive um, interview, a set of interviews. Uh, we went to 26 settlements in uh, uh, Handonia, Randonia, and in Pará, we visited 751 households and did complete socioeconomic breakdown. And these were both social movement-led um, uh, uh, settlements as well as you know, more uh, spontaneous settlements. And 74% said that cattle was a primary activity. Our main concern at the time wasn't, well, what kind of cattle? What are you doing with the cattle? We were concerned more about with their direct, act, their direct action landers and how they got the land, how they chose. Um, but this was really interesting to see. We didn't expect it, especially in some of the sites, like the MST sites, that we would see this. Um, so what we decided to do is follow this up. And so we did another uh, research in 2011. And basically, we went to these settlements. Here is uh, the south of Pará, and here are the settlements with which we visited. These were the same settlements we visited in 2006, and we were actually were able to identify, there were 121 uh, households we could identify that were still there that said they did cattle, and we were able to actually go back and speak to 104 of them to find, okay, well, what are you doing with this cattle? Because um, we really didn't know. We knew they had cattle. We knew it was important, but we didn't know how and why. So the main objective of this research is to characterize the smallholder, their agricultural um, and cattle activities to determine um, how important is cattle really to their livelihoods and in what ways, and try to understand why. Well, why are they not doing these green alternatives? Why aren't they doing agroecology? Why aren't they doing actually cropping? Um, and then, of course, in doing so, we try to identify what are the barriers to this more uh, alternative green production and implications for their welfare. And the results were kind of surprising to us. We did interviews with uh, residents. Like I said, we got to 85 of our original lots we were able to actually visit. Um, we went into key informant interviews, and we also collected regional data. This is a picture of Kita Maria in the field having wonderful conversations. She's now a uh, a researcher at Amazon. The basically, just to give you a general characteristics um, of the people, we don't have to go through that great detail. They did have, um, they averaged about their hectares were about 33 hectares um, on average, and they were at the limit between what they call the, the rural module, how big your land has can be to be considered a rural land that can be successful. Um, and so they, and therefore, if you have your land is within that mo module, that size, you can get agricultural extension. So all of them had the right land size to be successful. I think the land in the Amazon is probably much larger than you have here. So, you know, 33 hectares, I think it ranged from maybe some people had five hectares, others had 70 hectares. Um, these are just the small holders. You know, the large ranches, you know, 200,000 hectares and, and more, they're huge. So cropping systems, we asked about the cropping systems, and only 53% actually said they planted crops. 47% they didn't plant any crops. Um, 
and about 7% said they actually sold them to some local market. Corn, rice, and manioc were primarily the, what they planted, um, mostly to eat. Uh, very few actually sold it. There was some banana and cacao that was being uh, produced, uh, very little again being sold, even though the, the plants, many of the plants actually called for cacao and for banana to become an economically productive activity. Um, and in contrast, however, we used to look at the cattle in 2010, 71% you know, cattle had cattle. They were that was the more, most important activity. Um, and those who didn't have cattle, they didn't have cattle because they had to sell it for an emergency. And they all planned on rebuilding their cattle herds. So not one of them said, "Oh, we just decided not to do it." Uh, nine, about nine percent rent their uh, pasture. Interesting. We look at the, the cattle had. There was really no statistically significant difference between 2006 and 2011. So cattle's important, but the herds haven't grown. We do see that pasture area has grown, um, and density um, has declined. And that's not because of, it declined because they have more land and they don't have as many cattle, but the interesting thing is why they aren't having more cattle and greater density, and that's what we try to get to here. In terms of those who have cattle, 61% um, say they do more mixed meat, milk, uh, than meat, dairy. Then that's followed by dairy. Very few do just meat. Um, and 85%, they all said, without a doubt, that calving is the most, cow-calf operations is the most important activity. And 85% sell calves. So if you look at this, you'll see, you know, way more calves are being sold on order of magnitude than actual cows. And that was part of their, their system. What we were learning about is that they only sell the calves, the cows, when they get old and to cull the herd. So they, uh, they have, uh, keep reproducing the dairy, and they, the, the calves and the calves are the offtake, so they have pretty much of a balanced, which is good for their property size. Um, interestingly, they almost all sell to middlemen, and some of them sell to middlemen who sell directly to the ranchers, who were the original ranchers they were fighting with to begin with. Okay. So it's a pretty interesting dynamic uh, how that's working. And all of them had got credit for some type of cattle activity. In terms of how important is this to their income and to their livelihoods, you know, first of all, off-job employment was the number one, but this is kind of a skewed because there were a few people who were teachers and extension and they made a lot more. Uh, the average didn't make that much. Uh, the most important was government payments. They would receive uh, under uh, when um, Lula da Silva was president, uh, Bolsa Familia, a certain amount of money every month. They receive retirement. Um, they receive other types of benefits, you know, for how many children they had. And so that was really the, the, the biggest source of income came from these remittances from the government. But that was followed by calves. And calving and selling calves is very important. And the price of calves increased from you know, prior to 2006, it was like $100 per calf, and up to in 2011, it you know tripled in price. You had 300, 400 per calf. Um, despite the policies that they should do agroecology and, and cropping, and the plans that said they all were going to produce milk, so most of them said they were going to do dairy, um, and that's where they got their uh, credit for dairy production. Uh, really. Crops and milk is not that important source. In fact, um, monthly, monthly expenses. So we're trying to understand, okay, well, how much do they bring in and how much do they pay out? And so, interestingly, and it was surprising for some reason to think about, you know, they get credit, they're going to be agrarian reform, but these are actually loans, they have to pay them back. And so, a third of the income they do bring in goes to the principal and interest on their loans. The next is purchasing food. In fact, they all pretty much said, 88% say they buy most of their food from the grocery store. That, in fact, it's, it's just not worth it. Here's one uh, personal communication. You know, it's cheaper to buy vegetables and meat in the grocery store than produce it myself. So they're on an agricultural settlement, and they're not doing agriculture, cropping at least. The next is monthly credit installments. What's interesting here is electricity arrived with Luz para Todos, which is a policy of the government um, in about 2003. Well, they have to pay for that, but then that also enabled them to get uh, TVs, uh, refrigerators, 
um, DVD players, and they get that on credit. And when they got Los Familiados, they got credit. So now they're all in debt. And so they have to pay credit installments for their, their durable goods. Um, and then the remaining um, goes to medication, so water, urban rents where they send their children to school. So it was surprising to go to these settlements and find out that they're not doing agricultural cropping and they're not really engaged in the activities that they should be engaged in according to their policies or their plans. And so the question is, well, why? You know, what's happening and what are the barriers? Um, so we asked them, <laughs> straight up, you know, so why are you doing you know, this cow-calf operation but not the other activities? And they said, well, that's where the credit comes. We get credit for dairy. We could buy, you know, what is it, you know, four vacas and a bull. And we produce calves and we sell the males and we call them off and we have guaranteed income. They didn't get credit for other things. But it was supposed to be for dairy production. <laughs> And none of them are producing milk. Very few sell milk, very few actually even produce it for self-consumption. Um, they do sell some cheese sometimes to neighbors. Um, they also said that it's one thing that you have better economic return. It's guaranteed. The money, the price of calves is increasing, and there's always the middlemen coming around to buy the calves. And so it's a guaranteed, sure thing. Um, so it's the best option. And the extension workers we talked to, the extension officers, um, pretty much said the same thing. But yes, they all have separate, you know, they all have development plans. We can't give everyone their own individual development plan, and this works. And the government approves it, and the bank funds it. But it's supposed to be from milk and other things. There are other reasons they gave, I just, I'm focusing on those for right now. So credit's available, not credit's for livestock. Um, and there's also better economic return, guaranteed market. And here is where the insertion of Amazonia into the global cattle economy becomes uh, pretty relevant, I think. So um, we did a logistic regression, of course. Credit and pasture size was the main determining factor of whether they were involved in calving operations, um, without a doubt. And then looking at credit availability, this is just simple, uh, you know, uh, analysis we did. And um, the uh, to be having cattle and credit go hand in hand. And the same thing for the other activities. Well, you don't get credit, you don't do the other activities. Mm -hmm. And so one of the barriers to, I would think, green alternatives is there is no extension and there is no credit for it. Um, like I said, the credit that they do get is for milk production, five cows and a bull, and the externality, the extra product is calves, which happens to be the most important and lucrative um, source of income for them and, and, and steady. Uh, Thirteen percent said they sell. Said they sell sometimes limited to neighbors, but milk. None of them really even produce milk. So why is there a better economic return in the guaranteed market? Well, this is like I said, the insertion of Amazonia into the global cattle economy. The government investments were really successful, as you can see here. The uh, reduction in transportation time, which turns into transportation costs, made cattle activities much more viable. They invested in various uh, ways to eradicate you know, uh, foot and mouth disease. If you see here from 1970, the number of cases, all the way down between 2000 and 2004. Um, and then by 2007 in our study region, it was pretty much eradicated and it became uh, an export zone. So they could actually export beef. Before, you know, exports didn't come from the Amazon because of foot and mouth disease. And now they go you know, to Russia, to China, to Egypt, um, I'm not sure if they, how much we're going to Europe at this today, but um, every there's a you know, great deal of it. There's also, um, as Bob was mentioning in his talk, how you know the kind of macro economy, these you know, you know political economy is, is important. You have I think it's not supposed to be there. Uh, you have the the plan of real, and they, they dollarized the the the, the, the real. Um, and you can see for a while there that the you know costs were high, so exporting the meat was didn't work. But eventually they allowed it to the free flu fluctuation of exchange rates, and you can see you know all of a sudden that uh, so here's where they weren't selling as much. These are exports of beef. It kind of mirrors what you were showing, Bob was showing in terms of Mexico. But you see here this you know ramp up in exports of beef from from Brazil. And then there's also other agreements between Mercosul to get rid of tariffs, um, and then the, the mad cow outbreak in, in, in Britain. Basically, they had to get their 
be from somewhere, um, and then you have another you know, occurrence in the early 2000s. And so this really set the stage for the south of Parada B, in the region where I'm working, to be a primary source of beef for export markets. Um, and here's just a few, I can show how the herd size you know, increased more than three times, threefold between 1990 to 2005 in the state of Pará. Um, looking at overall productivity, you know, the average the productivity in the Amazon for calving, fattening, and calving and fattening is much greater than in other states. Um, and overall, looking at how the Amazon ranked in terms of exports of meat from, um, from Brazil, you know, 2,000, maybe 5% of Brazil's exports came from the Amazon. Uh, today, more than 21% come from the Amazon. And so, through a short period of time, exporting beef became really important. It, it, during the same time period, these new industrial slaughterhouses were all built in the South of um, So here are the main slaughterhouses that were built, that are, are registered. JBS, I wanted to talk a little bit about JBS, which is the largest meat producer in the world, a radio that now owns uh, Swift, Pilgrim's Pride, Plum Rose, um, pretty much all U.S. meat production is owned by JBS, which is in fact a, a Brazilian-Argentinian company. But they're in the, in the south of Pará, so it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. It makes sense. I'll tie this together in a minute. So by summary findings, well, smallholders aren't doing family agriculture, agriculture. It's very rare. Most of them buy their food from the grocery store. Um, really, the most important activity that they do is the cow-calf. Um, operations. And why? Well, that's where they get the credit from, and that's where they get their extension from, and they have a sure market, the global cattle economy, um, which is the second Amazon. We, as I demonstrated, the Amazon has now become you know, front and center in the middle of this global meat economy. So how do I tie this together? So we have one hand, you know, the, the smallholders aren't doing agroecology, they're doing calving, and at the same time you have you know, the large ranchers who are involved in the global production system. Well, it's really good for the ranchers for several reasons. First of all, environmental laws have, become, have come on pretty strong in the past 10 years or so, and they've restricted pasture expansion. As I said, the forestry code now, this region they already deforested, because they didn't enforce the forestry code. Now they're going back enforcing the forestry code, and so many of these large ranches have to reforest 50% of their property. They are getting credit and subsidies. The government's actually giving them the trees, and they're going to be planting uh, eucalyptus because they can harvest it to, for coal for the metallurgy. So they're going to have this new profit on the property, but they can't expand pastures. Um, there also is zero deforestation, which is a, a you know, more voluntary that you know, the supermarkets and such have said that they're not going to buy beef that involves deforestation. So they've got a certification process whereby you can have, a, you know, if you're a rancher and you demonstrate or you certify that that cow that you bring to the slaughterhouse has its origins on your property, and they can look at a road sense imagery and see that there has been no deforestation on your property, it's certified and you get a higher dollar amount. And so, but the market's still great, and the supply, where are they going to continue to get their supply of you know, meet in order to continue to meet the demands of the market. The solution are the smallholders. Um, and you know, they, they are able to provide them with the feeder calves and the, the uh, pasture on their lands. And so there's that leakage. You don't see it on their land, but you, that leakage is happening on in the settlements. And there are lots of settlements and lots of smallholders. Um, is it good for the smallholder? That's the question. Uh, well. They have dairy, and that's what they got their credit for, and the byproduct of dairy is calves, and calves are worth a lot of money. It would seem as though it's a good, uh, good situation. The question we've been interested in is, that, is that going to change the relationship between the smallholders and the large ranchers? I mean, they were, in fact, at war, and they're a very violent war. Are there, is there going to be less war and more collaboration since they are working together? Maybe. Um, basically, what we discovered in our research is that, you know, maybe not, because it may actually be bad for the smallholders. It's created this new dependency. They're dependent on these calves to sell, but they really don't have any control over the price they get for their calves. They have very small plots. 
you have to have 18 cows to go to the slaughterhouse and sell directly to the slaughterhouse. There are properties not large enough to accommodate 18 cows. And they're lucky if they produce one or two calves a year. So what happens is the middleman comes, and sometimes the middleman actually is the, the rancher, uh, who comes to them and says, you know, I'm going to buy this cow, the calves here, calves here, calves there, and he negotiates the price. And they have no power to really have any influence on that price. So oftentimes, they get a lower price. What also happens is that the rancher may come in and say, okay, we want your calves, but you know what? Your property needs to be improved. You need new fencing, you need new grass. You know, we will give you the fencing, we will give you seats for the grass, but then you need to pay us in calves. And so many of them are involved in this activity, and yet the question is, when are they going to start, or when are they going to pay off that debt? So you have this new, new form of debt peonage that seems to be present in especially several settlements in particular, and there were actually, right next to the, uh, the large rancher who used it on all the properties, sometimes they divide them in half and one half gets to be a settlement, the other the large rancher keeps. But they're in these type of relationships. You have this you know, uneasy relationship. Um, and so they're, they're, most of them haven't been paid from when we were talking with them recently. We're trying to get back down there and do some more work. Um, you know, they are increasing their debt. So they have to you know, buy their food. They buy their food on credit. They buy everything on credit. You know, they basically buy, improve their pasture on credit from the, uh, from the, the, the rancher. And in fact, it's creating, I, I believe, greater insecurity and, and greater vulnerability. You know, with the price of, of calves, if that you know, goes down, I mean, they're really dependent. And so we're arguing it's a new type of a land grab, one with contract farming going on, and a new wave of land conflict, and of course, continued deforestation. So the policies that were supposed to protect both the environment as well as the, um, the population, the, the small holders, that seems to have this other effect. occasion I read about uh, Brazilian uh, inclusive policies, uh, particularly Embrapa, Empresa uh, Brasileira de Pesquisa Agropecuaria, using a program of uh, technology transfer in, in, in milk and cattle, mm -hmm. uh, could um, reduce the poverty traps in short period of time. It's true. Um, it could. I mean, if, if there was enough extension, I mean, that was one of the concerns that the uh, extension officers had is that there's only so many of them, and there's millions of households. And so, you know, that's where, he, if they were able to get the extension, it could be successful. There has been some kukuasu, which is the fruit production, and certain times of year they make a lot of money from that. I think there's, there could be really great opportunities, but it's going to take a different investment, and it's going to take more time and take more energy. And at this point, even the extension officers say it's easier to just put down dairy, they do dairy, they'll get the loans, there's guaranteed um, income. So, yeah, I know people from Abrapa, and they're doing some pretty, really, really good work. Um, I know in uh, Thailandia, it's a, a region um, mostly settled by Japanese descendants, and they've had a lot of success, very successful agriculture. The sad thing I find, which is, this region has been plagued with conflict. Um, now it's a source where there's going to be these large infrastructure projects, uh, dams and railroads. Basically, the one, um, Palmares, the one settlement that is actually doing agriculture is going to be flooded. Um, and there's also now a realization that underlying all of these settlements are gold, is gold and other minerals. And Valle Giedose, which is a large mining corporation, already has concessions in those areas. And so, you know, my you know, hypothesis is that there's going to be new waves of conflict. Especially in some of these communities who have fought for so long and violently, they're not going to easily just give up their land. And so, yeah, I mean, it could be successful, but it would take more investment. Yeah, uh, what about soybeans? Because I thought, well, uh, you said that these small boats, they, they feed their cattle uh, pastor. But large ranchers, I think they also use soybeans, right? They do. I mean, I'm looking really at the, the smallholder end of it, not at the actual how the, you know, the, the large fazendeiros are doing it. I mean, yeah. you need to have a large property to have successful you know, soybeans. 
And you need to have large pasture to have, you know, livestock for livestock. These, their holdings aren't large enough for either of those. Mm -hmm. And I hope they're not actually feeding soybeans or anything to their, their cattle. Actually, when you ask, we asked them, uh, what do they want to grow in the future? And they would say, Asajukeshi, which is uh, fish grass, which is an invasive, because it kind of comes in there, that's the cattle. So, I mean, soybean is an issue, and there's a whole other, you know, indirect land use change because, you know, the soybean is expanding on former pastures and large ranches, but the large rancher doesn't become the soybean farmer. They move further into the forest and they have new pastures. Um, there's a paper by Richards and uh, Walker uh, that deals directly with this. I'm sure Bob can uh, speak about that. Well, if you want, if there's an interest, <laughs> let me just you know, briefly or send them a paper. Yeah, so soybeans, um, I think maybe, you know, the, the thought behind the question yeah. has to do with intensification, you know, shifting to, and an animal feed away from <coughs> a grass feed. <coughs> and if you look at Brazil, uh, any sort of intensification is largely confined to the southern part of the country. And the, the pastures in the north, uh, or I should say the, the ranches in the north, are largely traditional grass-fed systems. Now, the soybean production is the central part of the country. Uh, the central plains, which is in the state of Mato Grosso, and the very northern ridge of that was uh, well, an open forest, considered part of Amazonia. But in the soybean areas, it's, it's relatively far from, say, the places of uh, the new fields and pastures for cattle. And there's a large cattle herd within Mato Grosso itself, you know, millions of animals. And as far as I know, they, they may be feeding some soybeans to, to those cattle. However, those are cattle in areas that were originally savannas, so that <clears throat> there's no impact on the forest. Now, over the past 30 years or so, in in the Amazon itself, there's been some improvement in the stocking density, but it hasn't been great. I think it's gone maybe from one to 1.4 animals per hectare. So we haven't seen much intensification. Now, the impact of soybeans on ironically is not one of intensifying uh, the production of beef, it's one of displacing old pastures to new forest frontiers. So we're getting in the opposite effect, an extensification due to soybean agriculture via indirect land use change. I think the issue in the Amazon is there's so much land available and it's so cheap. And so there's no real motivation to intensify production. Now if they were to create lots of protected areas and you know, stop you know, the land, they could create no-go zones and boundaries um, and that would, that's the only way really to stop, I think, the expansion. Hey, Jamila, like, um, thank you for all the presentation. It was very, very interesting. Um, I have a few questions. Um, I'm wondering um, if the occupation occurred near to cities, to a particular city. I believe that it mm -hmm. would happen, and there are reasons for that. Yeah. Can you I can. Actually, that? that was part of our 2006 research. We were interested in understanding. So colonization had stopped in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So they had settlement projects that were part of the colonization plan, and they were along the in three colonization zones, um, what they call PICs, mm -hmm. along the Trans Amazon Highway. But we saw that you know, there were new settlements way beyond, and you know, as you go down the roads further away, the feeder roads from the main Trans Amazon Highway, there were new settlements. Um, and so we were trying to understand what is this new phenomenon? Because everyone was talking about colonization, the colonization's gone, or spontaneous colonization, when in fact there was something more happening here with the, uh, the social movement-led occupation. And even the, what we thought were uh, spontaneous colonization, and that mostly happened on the, text, on the outside uh, perimeter of the colonization zones, um, where you have you know, one or two and three and four, and next thing you know, a whole bunch of people occupy a feeder road beyond into the forest you know, edge. Um, and then if enough of them gather and are there and they want to create a settlement, they can go petition um, INCRA for uh, the rights to that. And then they have the same process. They've got to create an association. They have to create a development plan. So we had these type of settlements that were really further out in the colonization areas where there, in fact, was forest still. And then we have the social movement led Ones, and those were mostly nearby certain cities and towns, really because they were targeting the private property. 
And the private landowners, of course, they're the ones who have all the land along the roads because it's accessible and it's more valuable. And so they expand their, their pastures there. And so most of them are you know, on the fringe or out beyond the um, beyond cities, towns. And but that's the case across the Amazon. Um, you'll see that kind of a pattern. Uh, but there is, we classify this touristic kind of idea of spontaneous colonization versus SMO-led. Yeah, well, it's spontaneous dollar because it's still direct action land reform. The government's not doing it for them. Um, and then the SMO, direct action land reform. And there are many of, many of the people who were involved in the SMO activities and occupations um, were in the cities. You know, they didn't have jobs. They may have been children of parents who came earlier. Um, many of them you know, originated the urban area, but if you actually trace back, before they went to the urban area, they were in the rural area. So they had this rural, urban, rural migration. So you have, you know, first that is, oh, people are gonna leave the rural areas, they're all moving to the city because there's great opportunities. Well, there's not great opportunities. And so then they get organized with these social movements to go out and occupy land so they kind of return to the other countryside. So we do see that. That is very interesting because this gives a particular context to your story. That may explain why people is spending the money in such a way mm -hmm. that, that uh, actually is completely different to what you expect. Right. right? And also, this give a particular, uh, also probably explain uh, about the sources of money, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, because they do not obtain all the money from, from farming or from carving or from, or from, right. from agriculture that you were expecting. Mm -hmm. and, um, this is interesting because um, my next question is about the life of the people. If you ask a question regarding the improvement of the life of people before the occupation of the land mm -hmm. and after, and if there is any difference of improvement. Yeah. Um, that was part of our questions about, about their, how they perceive improvements to their livelihood. Um, and there's, that was a question I would ask frequently. I would take, I'd taken a bus from, um, from Altamira, which is a one town along the Trans-Amazon, to Uruara, which is another town along the Trans-Amazon. And I love to have conversations with people next to me. And without a doubt, everyone, um, they are happier, life is better in the Amazon, where they are, than where they came from in the Northeast, without a doubt. And the same thing in, in the South of Peran. They're all, I mean, there is a real distinction between the SMO-led um, occupations and, and dollar activities than the more spontaneous. Um, and that's, like I said, part of that research we did in the NSF project. And it's, I write about it in, um, in a world development paper, if you're interested, I can give you my card. And, yes. Yeah, because there is a difference. And we, we hypothesized that we would see this dynamic being those in the spontaneous or more uh, agriculturally uh, you know, inclined, their parents were probably agriculturalists, they may be children from farmers who went, whereas in the cities, they may be more you know, urban-based, not as good as ag with agriculture end. Um, I think the, the, it, there is an issue there. Many of them said they wanted to do agriculture, but they really have made food cheap. And I think a lot of that does go back to all these neoliberal reforms and you know, the same thing that's made you know, cattle, globalized cattle economy viable has also made food cheaper. And they are satisfied, none of them on the settlement want to get rich. Yeah. So they have enough money to pay what they need to pay. And so they, they aren't necessarily producing more. The big concern though is, um, and I have a colleague of mine at the Federal University of Peran who's looking at this, um, Hilton Santos, he's a the health. Because now none of them actually are producing food, they're buying food. And that food isn't healthy. And he's done studies across the Amazon and seeing more diabetes and more overweight and all these other issues. And the other issue is they're all getting in debt. Mm -hmm. So my concern under Bolsonaro, who's pulling back on those you know, uh, government subsidies, what happens when that money comes due? If they can pay, because they'll buy something for poor base. So they buy, you know, they buy these jeans and they pay you know, 10 payments of 25 pay ice. And so every month they've got to pay the, the, the money. It adds up. But what happens if they can't pay it? And what's going to happen? And so, and it's pretty widespread from what I gather talking to others. Right. You know, the kind of the unintended consequences of some of these government subsidies and maybe investment in ag actual agricultural extension agroecology could have been a better investment than Bolsa Familiata and some of these others. Because they give them the sense of not to 
even in some of the in indigenous territories, they get bolsa de miliad and other subsidies, but they have to go to the municipal seat to get that money. And that more or less time that they have to actually do agriculture and do things, they become dependent on it. So. Okay. Um, I'm talking about health. Um, I, I think, especially I feel that they are quite exposed to zoonotic diseases. Mm -hmm. So, what do we do to control those parasitical uh, diseases? And, and if there is any study of, did you explore the, the, the I don't know. Yeah, there actually is. It's yeah. very difficult. Brucellosis. It goes from to your cow calving. That's right. And in those particular kind of, of farming systems, actually they are quite exposed to them. Yes. They are very vulnerable. Yeah. So I don't know if you explore this kind I was actually exploring. I had a colleague of mine at Michigan State University when I was there. I was in charge of um, Brazil UNSU uh, exchanges, and I was kind of putting them in contact. Um, he was interested, interested in brucellosis. Um, and we were talking to um, the farmers, and it's funny stories that my um, Ethan would tell me, and we were discussing um, all about, you know, yeah, they, they actually sell the cow and get look sick. And then you ask them, well, where do you sell the cow to? It's to the local butcher. Mm -hmm. And they sell the cheese to the local. But Brazil is really protective to even raise the study of doing a study in that region that's now, you know, a free export zone that they can export from. I mean, that could completely wipe away their whole economy by saying, study that. Um, and we're pretty sure there's brucellosis there. And there was issues in terms of how to even get that kind of a study going. There's also um, several other, uh, what is it? Um, tuberculosis. Yeah, they also have, you know, um, uh, um, well, they have, well, this particular community have a lot of uh, leprosy, and they have a lot of, um, so there's some interesting stories. But there's the other one, I think it was, um, oh, it's um, cutaneous. It's not much mice, it's actually a, no, I'll think about it. <laughs> but they found you, a colleague of mine studies it in Egypt. And they didn't understand how did it get to Egypt because they don't have that disease here. And it's interesting because it, they started exporting from the south of Farah beef, uh, cows whole. And so there could be that link. That's another one of those really difficult things to begin to study. So we're kind of brainstorming and talking with our colleagues about it. But it is a really sensitive issue, and I'm not sure the Brazilian government wants anyone studying for the the. the Industrial slaughterhouses and the large ranches, they have everything pretty well controlled or at least certified. <laughs> so the small holders, they're doing it, it's illegal. And so no one, I mean, it's an illegal, you know, entrance into the system, but it's, no one's watching. Yes. Um, Thank you very much. Hi, thanks. Hi. <coughs> yes, real life is very complicated. <laughs> relations between the groups of people and the people environment. Two very simple questions. One, you had a table which showed, which showed that the productivity cows per hectare per year uh, is much higher in the Amazon. But of course, you've also been saying how that, that's not for an economic reason. The land is free, the land is cheap, the land is available. So, or I guess there's physical reasons for that. But sec I'll, I'll give you the second question, which is a completely different one. Um, uh, when you talk about, I'm just thinking when you're talking about the smallholders, and, uh, um, well, the smallholders, one of the things they need is to uh, expansion of scale. Um, and in one very particular thing, you said they can't sell their, their animals in the, in the slaughterhouse because they, each one doesn't have enough. Well, the obvious, obvious solution answer there is cooperatives. Yeah. And I'm wondering if one reason they don't form cooperatives, I mean, there could be all kinds of external pressures, but also the origin of the people, that people are coming. They're, they're not a community who are coming, but people coming from many, many different places, yeah. many urban people, per se. And that's a reason why it's difficult for them to form cooperatives. Yeah. In terms of the economic, it is for economic reasons, because when you look at the factors of production and the cost, the land is cheap, it's free. So yeah. that doesn't go into, so it can't be more productive economically. Um, in terms of cooperatives, that's actually a lot of, there's been much study of how come cooperatives aren't successful. Uh, the MST in particular, that was their main, originally creating cooperatives, um, designing the settlements such that they will be cooperative, like they call the high of the soul pattern, where you have everyone lives in an agrovilla and they all do the same agriculture and these rays from the sun. It, it sets up the situation where they would be cooperative. Um, but many of these, I, I think there is an issue of who are the participants. 
Um, they are coming from different, you know, from urban areas. Um, I don't think there's, even though they have the first few years when you're part of these movements um, and you're going to do an land occupation, they coordinate you and they organize you into groups. And they have like six different, six, seven, eight different committees. Each one has a responsibility. They have to meet. They have to organize. And the belief is that that's going to create that cooperative spirit. But often it seems once they get their land, everyone kind of goes off in their own way. Um, and many of the people who I've spoken to, and I've spoken to lots of them, you know, they are maybe participants in the MST's occupation, but afterwards they've always wanted to have their own piece of land. Um, and they never have a problem with working and you know, engaging in the markets. I think the unions the, are also, um, the syndicates are probably stronger in the Amazon than the MST is, and they don't have that political, you know, you know um, philosophy. And so many of them also have that, and they they want to better themselves and, and such. So there is, seems to be issues. And now uh, I had a student had a student who wanted to work on that. She gave it up because she thought it was too dangerous. But <laughs> trying to understand why those cooperatives cooperatives fail. The they, they have more of a tendency to fail than they have to be successful, unfortunately. And I think it goes back down to you have to invest time and energy and and it's gotta be constant. And when you're talking about, you know, thousands of settlements and you know, millions of households, the resources, Brazil doesn't have the resources or the energy or the, to actually invest. con la charla de Bob y Cintia y, y bueno, la idea de la investigación fue justamente, eh, como decía Bob, ver si en las zonas templadas justamente eh, iba a haber una transición forestal por la intensificación que se está haciendo y por la supuesta intensificación y por el movimiento hacia los feedlots y demás, podríamos ver supuestamente, hipotéticamente, en bosques eh, templados como en la Cuenca Lago de Páscuaro y, y demás, en la región Purépecha donde yo trabajo, íbamos a ver transición forestal. Esa era la gran pregunta, pero también la pregunta era de caracterizar los sistemas ganaderos. En la parte de la transición forestal eh, no está aquí en esta presentación, la, estamos trabajando con Jaime y seguimos trabajando con ellos, no voy a contestar esa pregunta porque no, no lo vimos así tan evidentemente, y la que, pregunta que voy a contestar tiene que ver con la producción de ganado en una zona templada, en una zona este, eh, de México templado, ¿no? Entonces, eh, bueno, básicamente, rápidamente voy a hablar sobre qué pasa, un poco ya lo vio Bob, eh, la agricultura en México, la ganadería, el, el, el sistema mixto, eh, y bueno, como saben, México es un país mega diverso, es un centro de origen y diversidad de maíz, y bueno, en estas cadenas alimentarias el maíz es muy importante, en la cadena, como vimos en Brasil, como vimos en, en otras partes del mundo, el maíz es un parte importante para dar de comer a las vacas. Y bueno, el maíz se produce en México de manera muy importante y una gran parte de la producción de maíz ocurre en tierras de temporal y por pequeños productores. No me voy a detener en esto, ustedes ya lo conocen. Eh, y hay 8 millones de productores pequeños y medianos en México ligados con la producción de maíz y dicen que podrían, de hecho, alimentar potencialmente, eh, acaba de salir un artículo, a 50 y casi 55 millones de personas en México. Eh, la producción de carne en México, no me voy a detener eh, porque ya lo explicó Bob, eh, ha, se ha incrementado muchísimo a partir del Tratado de Libre Comercio, ups, perdón, ahí. Eh, 
el alto aumentado, eh, de hecho, y la, la producción de carne que se procesa y se vende ha aumentado incre increíblemente y de hecho las exportaciones de carne podrían crecer hasta el 15% en este año comparado con lo que fue el año pasado en México. Eh, vemos que uno de los principales estados, bueno, eh, Jalisco, eh, Durango, el norte de México, Michoacán también está jugando un papel muy importante y, eh, y justamente por eso también aquí a ellos les interesaba hacer el trabajo aquí en Michoacán. Ahora, la gran pregunta es, bueno, ¿de dónde viene toda esta carne? Vimos que hay una parte importante de los becerros que, como decía Bob, vienen de Central América, América Central, hay una parte importante que viene de este, del sureste de México, que van engordadores y que estos engordadores, esto que llamaban feeders, ¿no? los llevan al feedlot, pero hay una parte que se tiene que proveer, digamos, por el pequeño productor de carne. Eh, ¿Quiénes son estos pequeños productores en México, en, en las zonas templadas, en zonas eh, como la de Cuenca, el lago de Pátzcuaro, que tiene mucho que ver y que comparte bastante con otras regiones como el Estado de México, como Jalisco, como el Bajío y demás, eh, es representativa de estas zonas templadas. Y lo que vi, en la, una de las preguntas que, de las primeras preguntas que va al cuestionario era si había gente que no tenía ganado, ¿no? si había productores de la muestra que escogimos que no tenía ganado. Aquí Citlali, esta que participó en la encuesta, dice que no encontramos productores que, que no tuvieran ganado. Encontramos como unas cuatro familias, pero era o porque se los habían robado o porque ya los productores estaban muy grandes para tenerlo. Pero no encontramos productores que no tuvieran ganado. Y encontramos, en realidad, no encontramos tampoco solo ganado. O sea, productores de ganado que no tuvieran agricultura o que no tuvieran maíz encontramos sistemas mixtos. Eh, entonces, ¿qué es el sistema <coughs> mixto? Bueno, según Thornton, tiene que ver con eh, que se produce el más del por ciento de la materia eh, seca utilizada para alimentar, el ganado viene de un cultivo de una, de, que en este caso viene de maíz, mucho más, pero que más del 10, y que el, el, el valor de la producción eh, <coughs> provenga de otras actividades eh, agrícolas no relacionadas con el ganado. ¿no? Eso es, es así como se define. Y bueno, eh, ya dijimos que, que el maíz en, relaciona, bueno, en México es muy importante y también es, da contexto también a estos sistemas mixtos que, que son también diversificados. En esta región que trabajamos es muy importante de, desde el punto de vista de maíz, porque es un centro también eh, de origen y diversificación de maíz, además la cuna de la, de la región purépecha, de la cultura purépecha, y en otros estudios hemos visto cómo, eh, pues qué ha pasado en estas zonas eh, donde yo estoy trabajando. Lo que hemos visto es que la población ha aumentado, eh, la población, básicamente la población rural, eh, en ciudad, de ciudades pequeñas y también periurbana y rural ha aumentado en esta región, Hemos visto que la, eh, el, la actividad económica es la PEA, ¿no? la, eh, lo, lo, que, lo que lleva a la, al, al, digamos, al, al producto eh, que viene de la agricultura, de, de, de la silvicultura y pesca, en general la tendencia es, en algunas regiones, en algunos municipios ha, ha disminuido, en otros está estable eh, el producto interno bruto y la población que, este, que habla pura fecha. Eh, bueno, vemos que hay, que, que son monolingües, está, eh, digamos que a, está estable también, y los que son bilingües están, de alguna manera están incrementados en eh, población pura fecha. Vemos también que la, la producción, perdón, la, 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 la superficie dedicada al maíz ha disminuido en general en estos municipios. Eh, y por otro lado, muy importante decir, en otro estudio vimos que la riqueza de diversidades o de la diversidad, el número de razas por, por hogar sigue igual eh, en cuanto a la riqueza que hicimos otro estudio con, con Quetzal. Y bueno, dado este contexto que, ligado con el trabajo de Bob y Cintia, ¿qué 
cómo se puede ligar, está ligado o no esta, esta producción de, de carne, cuál es el papel de la ganadería en este sistema, cuál es el impacto socioeconómico ambiental a escala unidad y a escala a unidad de producción de comunidad y de región, ¿Qué, cuál sería el impacto en la seguridad alimentaria eh, y qué tipo de recomendación se podría generar para hacer este... Eh, pues para mejorar esos sistemas de producción. Entonces, lo que, vimos, lo que vimos es que, bueno, utilizamos la metodología, básicamente el planteamiento metodológico tiene que ver con, con eh, artículos que hay gente como Ar Ar Arriaga Jordán, que ha estudiado mucho la ganadería en México, la lechería, los sistemas productivos de zonas templadas en México, también con... Eh, metodología que tiene muy parecida a lo que ha utilizado Sin Peralta y Simons, que, que, que describió ahora Cintia, y Kellen, que es un estudia, estudio de CIMIT, que estudia maíz, pero también estudia producción de maíz y forraje para ganadería. Sí, consultaron estadísticas de diferentes fuentes, hicieron entrevistas semiestructuradas, informantes clave, y también se hicieron 120 cuestionarios en, el, en el, el año pasado y todavía continuamos con el trabajo de campo porque hay algunas preguntas que todavía no se han contestado. Bueno, un poco a un lado lo que describía Bob, eh, lo que vemos es que en Michoacán hay una tendencia, es el maíz a la producción de maíz, sabemos que la superficie ha disminuido, pero la producción ha aumentado, lo que tiene que ver con una intensificación de la producción y la carne sigue aumentando poco a poco y la tendencia es a aumentar. Los precios en Michoacán, vemos que en el maíz bajaron, se estabilizaron y subieron el precio de maíz, acá faltan los datos del 80 que Bob ya me dijo que tenemos que poner los datos del 80, si no, no vemos cómo esto, esto que él comentaba, el impacto del TLC y el impacto de cómo cayeron los precios de maíz y cómo ha ido subiendo el precio de la carne, que se ve aquí drásticamente como ha estado subiendo en Michoacán. Cuando hablamos de la, de la región en donde yo trabajo, vemos que esto eh, cambia un poquito, tiene que ver con el contexto eh, internacional y nacional, y vemos que la producción de carne se estabiliza, se estabiliza, pero en, es, en estos 2000 se incrementa, hay una caída aquí de producción de carne, y el precio baja, sube, baja, se estabiliza y sube drásticamente el precio de carne. Eh, aunque la tendencia es a subir eh, los precios y, la, y eh, la producción de carne y también la producción de maíz. Este, bueno, ¿Quién es el productor de este sistemas mixtos? ¿Cómo lo podemos este, caracterizar? Bueno, básicamente el promedio es de, de 57 años, el número de personas que viven en hogares alrededor de 5 personas, la superficie, eso es muchísimo menor que en el, que en el Amazonas, o que en, son 4 hectáreas en promedio lo que se tiene. Estamos hablando de personas que tienen 2 hectáreas hasta 30 hectáreas que pueden llegar a tener. Eh, la frecuencia, ¿qué ha pasado? ¿Cuáles han sido los cambios registrados? ¿Qué es lo que queremos ver antes y después en cuanto, por ejemplo, la alimentación del ganado, que es lo que en estos sistemas mixtos? Hemos visto que hay un cambio drástico eh, en cuanto a que se utiliza más grano. O sea, el grano de el 55% de los entrevistados dan grano para alimentación, ha aumentado ahora. El rastrojo de, también ha sido incrementado. Hanamargo, los dos, este, los dos periodos se usa mucho el Hanamargo, que es una leguminosa. La avena ha incrementado, o sea, hay más personas alimentando con avena el, el ganado la alfalfa también, el pasto más o menos igual, se recoge el pasto y se lleva y el ensilaje es una actividad que antes no se hacía y ahora se hace para mejorar el, 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 la alimentación y el procesamiento del alimento de ganado. ¿Cuál es el sistema de manejo? Yo podría decir que es un sistema de manejo mixto, pero también se podría hablar de que es un sistema agroforestal porque se incluye, es in, bueno, muy importante que el 86% de los de los este, familias llevan a pastar el ganado y el, el resto lo tienen estabulado, pero es un ganado, es una producción extensiva, básicamente en el día el, los animales están afuera, una parte importante lleva al bosque, 
siguen llevándolo al bosque a pastar. Este, una parte importante, perdón, una pequeña parte que, que se ha reducido drásticamente, ese es otro resultado, van a tierras con pastizales y que podría ser también la, la orilla del lago, se podría incluir aquí. Y hay una parte importante que tiene que ver con la, con la agricultura. Son básicamente este, cuatro parcelas en promedio, en promedio, se tienen de dos a cuatro parcelas, cinco hectáreas, eh, una, par, una par, porción o una parcela es dedicada al maíz y otra parcela, otras parcelas, porque puede ser en diferentes parcelas, dedicadas a cultivos forrajeros. Esto rota, puede ser una rotación entre parcelas y la, la parcela de, 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 dedicada a la producción forrajera es una parte generalmente, o una parcela que está dedicada a avena y la otra a una leguminosa que mayoritariamente es este veg o es este, este janamar, que también va rotando. Esto es básicamente para una importante, eh, digamos, eh, fuente de alimento para la familia, el, maíz, el 86% de la familia consumen eh, y son autosuficientes en cuanto al maíz, eh, el 70% de las familias de, eh, utilizan este maíz para alimentar el ganado, sea grano o sea forraje, y hay una importante porción de familias que venden maíz como forraje y también venden otros cultivos, y por supuesto venden el ganado. ¿No? Eh, este, el número de cabezas, eh, lo que también vimos, hicimos un análisis para ver la correlación entre la, el tamaño de la parcela y el, el tamaño del lato. Y vimos que el tamaño del lato tiene que ver, está correlacionado con el tamaño de la parcela que produce maíz. Es decir, que es una producción racional que tiene que ver con la producción de maíz. Por eso digo que están correlacionados altamente dependientes. Lo que hemos vi visto en el tiempo es que la composición del lato eh, ha, ha cambiado. Eh, vemos que esto sería el, el, lo verde, perdón, lo, lo azul serán los becerros, los rojos son toros y lo verde son las vacas, que han disminuido las vacas y han aumentado los becerros eh, que, eh, se, que se venden. O sea, la composición ha sido diferente y el número de cabezas totales ha aumentado de 177 a 422 cabezas, eh, que ha sido un cambio drástico en el número, o sea, la cantidad de animales ha aumentado drásticamente y la composición es diferente. Menos vacas, más becerros. Por otro lado, el propósito también es diferente. Estos son de los 80, de los 2000, de este, el año pasado, y lo que vemos es que hay antes hay una porción muy importante para la, le llaman para reproducción o para vientres, que se le llama, y ahora han disminuido la cantidad de vientres y ha aumentado la cantidad de para carne. O sea, antes esto es para carne lo azul, o no, azul morado, ha aumentado la cantidad de, de, o sea, de, de personas que básicamente venden mucho más, el destino va para los carnice, las carnicerías. ¿no? Eh, antes, eh, es importante para la reproducción y carne, ahora también ha aumentado para la reproducción y carne, y por supuesto la yunta, antes había ganado para yunta, ahora ya no vimos más que una persona que tenía yunta, eh, antes el, el, los animales también se utilizaban para, para el trabajo en, el, en la tierra, en la agricultura, ahora ya no se usa, es difícil ver yuntas trabajando eh, en el campo. Eh, el destino final también ha cambiado, la carnicería, perdón, este sería para la carnicería lo azul y lo rojo sería para los ganaderos. Los ganaderos me refiero a los intermediarios, perdón, Miroman, que les llaman intermediarios, rastro. Ha aumentado la cantidad, el destino que llevan a los rastros ha aumentado, ha aumentado, ha disminuido la carnicería y han aumentado estos intermediarios, o sea, ya más este, eh, agricultores o productores llevan, el, el, el intermediario va al, a la, al rancho y les compra en el rancho el, el becerro, bueno, la vaca, depende de lo que quieran vender, vaca o becerro, y este, ya dis, ha disminuido la, la venta a la carnicería o a la, al matadero. El, 
el rastro sería lo verde, aumentado los rastros, estos son los rastros municipales, que también he inventado, este, y eh, bueno, son las primeras conclusiones, todavía estamos digiriendo estos datos, son las primeras porque estamos tratando de ver estos mil humanos o intermediarios, quiénes son, eh, aparentemente están pagando lo mismo que la carnicería, pero no nos checa que estén pagando lo mismo, pensamos que, está, que probablemente eh, ellos lo venden, a, pensamos que o lo engordan y lo venden a feedlots, pero todavía no hemos encontrado la conexión con, este, con el feedlot. Estábamos, esa fue la primera entrada, la primera pregunta, la conexión con la, las cadenas, pero todavía no lo vemos claramente. Lo que, lo que sí vimos es que es un sistema que podríamos llamar como la contraparte, es como la contraparte del sistema que describía Cintia de la, este, producir hasta el becerro y de ahí vaya el feedlot, es eh, básicamente muy, muy característico y, y se puede decir que comparte con otras zonas de, de, de zonas templadas, en que tiene que ver con que hay una dependencia entre el, el ganado y el maíz, hay una relación muy importante, eh, ya que el tamaño del ganado se correlaciona con la cantidad de maíz producido, y el ganado articula, articula eh, la unidad de producción y el paisaje que se puede ver en las comunidades, porque va su alimentación y la interacción con estos componentes y tierras, agrícola, pastizal y bosque. Eh, hemos visto cambios significativos en la cantidad y propósito del ganado, la orientación, más maíz, menos tierras para pastoreo, el destino también se ve, más, eh, se ve que ha cambiado, Mejoramiento genético, la inversión que se hace también ha cambiado. Hay más mejoramiento, este, sementales, inversión en rotación de sementales y todo ha, ha incrementado, también muy importante. Este, se sigue estando ligado, básicamente el destino es para el consumo local eh, y a la seguridad alimentaria. Este, podemos decir que hay una baja dependencia en consumo en insumos fósiles porque no están, casi no compran eh, forraje o pienso compuesto que viene de producción de, gran, de la gran agricultura, aunque sí, la mayor parte de eso no lo puse, de los productores usan fertilizantes químicos y usan plaguicidas, eso no lo puse. Eh, y, este, y bueno, poca asistencia técnica, hay algunos pro, pro, pro GAN y pro agro han subsidiado a algunos de estos productores, muchos de, de ellos no han recibido subsidios, no hay ningún técnico, ningún asistente, los únicos técnicos que podemos encontrar son los veterinarios que se cargan básicamente de, las, de, de, de manejar las inseminaciones eh, y este, podrían eficientizar la, la producción para eh, reducir los gases de efecto invernadero, se podría hacer todavía mejor, mejor digamos que pasaran menos tiempo pastando, todo esto podría ser una, a diferencia de lo que explicaba Bob, de la intensificación y la mejora, aquí también se podría trabajar en hacer más eficiente la producción, eh, pero en general, pues, eh, pues bueno, básicamente, esas serían como las, eh, los, 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 los resultados, y, y creo que... Y nada, y muchas gracias al equipo. Pues gracias a ustedes. Por su ¿Preguntas? Sí. Marta, tengo una pregunta. Este, no sé si también pueden relacionar estos cambios que han habido en estos años de, eh, de el uso de, o, o de que que ha aumentado el ganado en, en estas áreas con el cambio de, de si es que el cambio en las semillas ¿no? eh, por ejemplo del, del tipo de, de, ah, no, de maíz sí, porque, sí, porque también hay una relación importante bueno, no sé si sí, perdón, es que no, no lo puse eh, eh, lo, 
80 y tantos por ciento de los productores usan maíces nativos, maíces criollos. Okay. No se usa híbrido y si se usa, usa sí se puede usar para, sobre todo para forraje. Okay. Pero no, 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 no se usa. ¿Usan maíces criollos para Todos para son maíces criollos. Sí, todo es a base de maíz criollo. Pero utiliza, utilizan este otro tipo de, 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 por ejemplo, tractores. Motos, tractores sí. Utilizan tractores. ¿Y, sí. y qué otras? ¿Qué otra um, tecnología, qué otros insumos utilizan? Porque también a veces esto va muy relacionado, ¿no? Tú mencionabas un aumento en el uso de fertilizantes, un aumento en el uso de sí. pesticidas. Este, de... Todos mencionar es usar fertilizantes químicos. Uh -huh. No se usa mucho el plaguicida, uh -huh. pero sí se usa. Pero el fertilizante químico sí es impresionante, cómo ha aumentado. Y los tractores, no lo puse, perdón, pero sí hay más tractores. O sea, el barbecho se hace con tractor, eh, el paso de escarda se hace con, a lo mejor con algún animal, caballo, yunta ya no tiene, con caballos o con herbicida. Ya no pasan, ya no pasan escar en, hacen la, los labores, la primera y la segunda escarda, sino que aplican herbicida. Entonces, herbicida sí es impresionante como fertilizante, es químico. Y herbicida es como el nuevo actor de la agricultura pequeña. Y sí. sobre todo por el tema de la intensificación, ¿no? Meter más animales o querer eh, tener animales que se necesitan de alguna manera intensificar más para dar ¿sí? No lo hemos visto tan así, no lo hemos visto tan así. Okay. No con, con eso, más bien, yo creo que tiene que ver más, y eso es algo que no hemos visto y que Cintia me ha dicho, con la economía familiar, cuánta gente ya está eh, quedándose. El 60% dijeron que van a tener relevo generacional. El hijo va a dedicarse, el 40% no se va a dedicar a esto, ¿no? Entonces va a haber una reducción, yo creo que en el de pequeños productores, va a haber, yo creo que va a haber una reducción en la población de gente que se dedica a esto. Y sí lo que se ha dicho mucho es más cara las, los jornales, más cara la mano de obra, más herbicida. ¿No? Entonces, este, eso es otro, otra... Yo eso es lo que lo veo, lo atribuyo a eso, okay. más que a la intensificación. Gracias. Sí. Sí, espera. Eh, bueno, era, es una pregunta así como muy concreta sobre una tabla que habías puesto de qué era lo que alimentaba o con qué se alimentaba el ganado en el, antes ah, de los sí. años 80 y con respecto a ahora. Y todo, me llamó la atención que todo había aumentado. Eh, sí. Es decir, ¿son, ¿son datos cuantitativos o es como sustitutivo? Es decir, no, antes... esto es la frecuencia de, todo, de los que hemos, de los 120 entrevistados, qué porcentaje ah. dice que uh, usaba esto, eso son frecuencias. Ok, vale, vale. Pero no es que, es que haya es sustituido un... un... O sea, okay. No, hay más gente diciendo que alimenta con ganado, vale. hay más gente diciendo que usa el rastrojo, hay más gente diciendo que usa el, insu... el pan amargo. Digamos que se, se siguen alimentando con lo mismo, pero con mayor... Bueno, Acá se ve que hay más productores que están alimentándolos con, con ganado, uh -huh. perdón, con grano de maíz. Okay. Normalmente el grano de maíz no se utiliza para, para alimentar el ganado. No se utiliza en, en, en ganadería extensiva, ¿sí? pero ahora ya más frecuentemente se está usando el grano. Sí, porque estos, estos vacas van a los pastos y van a los forrajes que están en las tierras agrícolas y en realidad el grano es un suplemento, pero no está como los feedlots basado en el alimento básicamente en el grano. Aquí no, esta es una ganadería diferente, es extensiva. Pero sí llama la atención que más productores les están dando granos que antes. ¿sí? Es como un indicador de intensificación, ¿no? de que están empezando a intensificar. ¿Sí? ¿Sí? ¿Te explico o no? No te quedas. Está bien. Les están alimentando mejor ahora. <risa> les dan más leguminosas, les dan más grano, bueno, mejor entre comillas, pero. Pero sí, porque antes lo que se usaba era que, que la gente se comía el grano y el rastrojo era para los animales. Y hoy día ya no es así. El grano puede ser para lo, las personas así es. y para los animales. Sí, y así se, así se sí, sí, y puede haber competencia sí, 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 por el grano. Hay. De hecho, hay por ahí ya un quick dice que las vacas están mejor alimentadas, el, ga, la, el maíz blanco de México va para las vacas y el maíz amarillo importado de Estados Unidos va para misa y maseca. Entonces, 
hay, dicen, por ahí hay una hipótesis, ah, sí. algo que tenemos que ver, que están mejor alimentadas las vacas que los... Que los... ¿Sí? Este, por ahí vi una pregunta. Hay muchas todavía, hay que trabajar estos datos. Bueno, sí pero... se ve que son preliminares. preliminares, porque sí, yo creo que es el manejo estadístico, porque sí. ahí habría que ver su o sea, muestra de claro. los pacientes, sí. lo de los porque sí, eso la o sea, no parece que la, diga nada. Claro, o sea, no. la frecuencia es como, tendría que sumar todo 100, ¿no? O sea, bueno, que el que no eh, la tabla, vamos. <risa> Exacto. La frecuencia son los porcentajes, o sea, esos 55 aquí, perdón, o sea, 50, de los 120, 55% de los 120 dijeron que usaban el grano y el 61%, o sea, casi la mitad, dijeron que usan... Ahora. Sí, eso lo, lo hice, lo tengo que presentar. Tiene razón, está es confuso. Sí, de acuerdo. Mike, <risa> perdón. You had, a, you had a diagram of a managed the cattle management system showing the ah, different sí. And I'm, I didn't quite follow it. Este? Yeah. Ah. And I'm wondering if you have some some ideas on how much people are using, or how much the cattle are using, uh, are, are free ranging in the forest. No, I don't have numbers. Pero puedo, pero but I, I wasn't sure if that's in your picture no. or not. Estos son, el, el, digamos, las, esos again, son frecuencias. El 56% de los entrevistados dijeron que sus vacas pastan en el bosque. Eso es lo que dice. Pero es el porcentaje de owners que responden a la pregunta. No el número de cattle, el tiempo. No, no, no. Es no el número. No. Tengo que hacer uno para. I will have to do another one for the number. Mm -hmm. yes, I don't know if I have. Sí. Like sí. Me surgió una duda con, con el dato que pusiste de, de un aumento de 138% en, la, en, el, en ah, las cabezas. Sí. Eh, porque ¿dónde están pastando esos son pastoreos libres ah, todas esas cabezas? Y si eso implica todo el nivel No, comunal, no es pastoreo libre. Pero esto. implica a nivel comunal eso, ese aumento. Estos son del total de los entrevistados. Cuando empezaron, en total tenían 177 cabezas. Y ahora tienen 420. Pero tienen la misma superficie de cultivo. Sí. Entonces el resto está en el, en el Monte Libre, pasando Monte Libre. Unos ponen en el Monte Libre, otros ponen el. el eh, les dan más alimento, están semi-estabuladas y les dan más alimento. Eh, exacto, sí, es una buena. ¿Cómo comen estas? Eh, sí, exacto. Porque la ver. capacidad de carga a nivel comunal, imagínate, ¿no? 130%. Sí. A nivel del bosque comunal, eso es un problema serio. Sí. Por eso la, la pregunta de la intensificación de, los, de, la, de la agricultura, ¿no? Uh -huh. que, que bueno, ese aumento, y si están, ahí tendría que ver si es la misma área que están utilizando, o sea, el expandido a lo largo de, de, del área que están ustedes analizando, este, y, 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 si ha, y si se ha intensificado la agricultura, ¿no? Que, que, que sería otra posibilidad bueno, para darle de comer a tantos animales. Eh, no, 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 no. Pues sí, o sea, cam, eh, pasaron y se duplicó el ato. Tenían cinco y ahora tienen, bueno, más de duplicar. Sí, casi. 14.5 vacas. Ajá. Por, por familia, sí. ¿Cómo están? Eso hay que ver. ¿Cómo, cómo ha afectado a la, la capacidad de carga? Sí, tiene razón. Y la otra rapidita es, no hay bueyes y eso, pero también tienen ganado eh, asnar y caballar, etc. Sí, ¿Cómo, eso no está aquí. ¿Cómo funciona? Yo, yo soy ignorante, el ganado nomás un bistec y un poquito de leche, es lo que me gusta. Ajá. <risa> eh, ¿Cómo funciona qué? ¿Cómo funciona el sistema de ellos con la parte de agricultura, con, el, con apoyo animal y de transformación de suelo, bueno, arados y... Ah, sí, como decía, eh, para el barbecho ya casi todo se hace con, con, con tractor, tractor ¿no? que era lo que se utilizaba la yunta para voltear la tierra. Ahora ya solamente se usa tractor. Y hay animales, eh, de caballos básicamente, mula, caballos, que son los que hacen las escardas. Pero eso no, no está aquí, solamente son vacas. Entonces habría que sí. añadir eso también. Y que también se usa mucho, recuerdo en las entrevistas, el estiércol como 
Ah, bueno, claro. Sí. Es que ahí falta la sí. Ajá. Arrows. Sí, sí. Luego también solamente la atacan de cheras como que ya también desaparecieron. Como que ya son muy pocas las que tienen, que todas son para carne. Ajá. Gorda. Sí. Pacas. Son las verdes. Para leche o para vientres. Para. Sí. Para. Bueno, pues. Muchas gracias por su